Welcome to the Tall and Urban Podcast by the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. This is Daniel Safarik. This is Season 1, Timber Rising, sponsored by the USDA Forest Service. We're talking with leading experts about mass timber, a way of building with engineered wood products that is gaining traction around the world. Today we're talking to Rob Foster, a lecturer in civil engineering at the University of Cambridge. Foster studies the potential of building tall with timber. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I think most people understand that on a uh, per length or uh, dimensional uh, basis, that timber is quite a bit lighter than steel or concrete. How does it compare on the strength to weight ratio? So in sort of absolute terms, most uh, timber is, is a lot less dense than uh, materials like uh, steel and concrete. Um, but when you look at um, sort of strength to weight ratio, you start to see that uh, it performs very much better than, uh, than concrete and uh, in, a, in a fairly similar way to, to steel. Um, so that, uh, and that applies to really its uh, strength to weight ratio and its, its stiffness to weight ratio. And both of those factors are, are terribly important when you're designing a structure because you need to know how strong it is, what sort of loads it can carry, but also what sort of um, deformations might be associated with carrying those loads. So, so stiffness is terribly important. I would like to ask about some of the new technologies that have come to the fore um, in mass timber production. Um, predominantly, I think the one that most people will be familiar with is uh, cross-laminated timber. Um, and can you explain a little bit about how that works in principle and, and how its uh, composition helps with constructability? Sure, yeah. So I, I think certainly um, uh, in the mainstream media and things like that, uh, the material we hear most about in terms of engineered timbers uh, is that cross-laminated timber. And I think there's, there's good reason for that. So it's... Um, a little bit hard to explain without a without a diagram, I suppose. But uh, it's made up of uh, essentially you're creating panels of uh, of timber made up from uh, smaller lamella, so uh, cut boards that are, are glued together. And in in the first layer they all run one way, and then in the next layer they run um, orthogonal at, at ninety degrees uh, to that, and then uh, we alternate. So we end up with this, um, this panel that could be used as, as say, a wall or as a slab. It's, uh, it's quite strong and stiff um, in both directions. Um, and, and that's good structurally. Uh, it's also uh, chunky. It has a certain amount of thickness. And that means it's, uh, it's also able to, um, to carry loads out of its own plane, so um, in bending. So we, we've used on a, a smaller scale this sort of approach, I suppose, in, uh, in materials like plywood. Uh, but because they're very thin, they don't really carry out of plane loads very well. Whereas when it comes to CLT, it's the sort of the chunkier, um, big sibling, I guess, of, of plywood in some ways. Um, we sort of hear people refer to it as jumbo plywood. Um, we can now not only carry in plane loads, um, say for shear walls, um, but also out of plane um, loads in, in floors. And it also allows it to work well as a wall without um, buckling too easily. Um, because you've got the timber running in, in two different directions, you've got those good strength and stiffness properties in those two directions, um, but you also have um, a certain amount of dimensional stability to the element so it's not um, so subject to um, sort of shrinking and swelling in either of those um, kind of main directions. Right but it seems that um, because of the innovations in the manufacturing process um, that most of the uh, 
uh, timber paneling that we will see on a construction site today was actually fabricated somewhere other than the construction site, uh, off site in a factory and then transported there and assembled, if not quite just in time, uh, the closest thing the construction industry has to just in time assembly, thus minimizing its exposure to uh, difficult weather that might cause warping or uh, drying out. Um, so I'm curious, um, do you know the, the, the relative advantage of um, constructability that this presents in terms of time or cost savings on site? Uh, well, certainly that prefabrication is, is potentially a huge advantage in terms of um, speed of construction, ease of construction, um, safety, which is always really huge. Um, I don't know that I'd be able to answer in terms of particular um, numbers what the programmatic uh, kind of advantage is going to be. To a certain extent, it's going to depend what you're comparing it to. If it was compared to a steel frame with precast concrete, um, maybe the advantages would, um, would not be so large or maybe, maybe it would even be quite similar. If you compare it to casting in situ concrete, um, then it's, it's uh, potentially huge. Um, it's certainly going to reduce the uh, the number of deliveries to site compared to something like in situ concrete, which in constrained sort of urban environments um, makes a big difference, um, both in terms of access and just um, sort of noise and traffic safety. Most buildings made of wood you'll see today are going to have quite a lot of at least steel and probably also concrete in them. So the importance does kind of come down to the connections uh, between the building elements. That's where buildings usually fail. Um, and I'm wondering if there is um, a, a developed protocol around what, what are the ideal kinds of connectors to use and, and in, in what kinds of situation, and maybe there's a way to, to generalize around that. Yeah, so it, it, it is very difficult to, to generalize too far, I guess, in terms of uh, structural design, at least, in the sense that it's uh, you kind of have to look at a, a building design or a structural design as a, a whole um, package. Uh, just thinking of it as, as sort of different bits um, rather than how it all works together can be be tricky for sure. The uh, the nature of the connections that you that you form between members is going to have a huge influence on on structural behavior and that's 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 true in in any material one of the key things that we do do want to see from connections generally because timber is quite a a brittle material in terms of its own behavior is is a degree of ductility so it's it's actually um in most cases going to be a good thing in a timber structure if where it fails is the connection uh, and we would like that to happen in a uh, in a predictable manner and in such a way that we see um, a ductile response and energy dissipating response from our, from our connections so that they act like, um, you know, potentially like a little fuse almost in the, in the structure. And that's going to be um, doubly important in a, in a sort of a seismic setting in the wind. We could go the other way and say we want a really, really tight connection. So we might glue in rods, um, which is another technology that we that we see, um, and that uh, kind of gets rid of some of those small movements, uh, but increases the chances that we're going to have a, a more sort of brittle failure at the connection. So there's sort of a bit of a balancing act um, to be performed there. Um, and I, I don't know that there is a uh, there is a clear right answer. It's going to be uh, picking the appropriate connection for um, for the system that you're trying to develop and taking a really a system view to the whole thing. So uh, I guess a question then would be, you know, you would have to expect me to ask this question: How high do you think we can reasonably build with today's timber panel systems? Yeah. So it's. Um, yeah, it's certainly a question that gets uh, that gets asked. So if we if I um, leave 
considerations of fire to one side for a second. Um, I think if you're talking about timber panelized systems, then we've already seen how high we can sort of economically go uh, with those um, in the absence of a, say, a concrete core. So, um, but to go past that sort of eight, nine, ten story mark, you know, requires a certain amount, or requires a certain amount of um, technological kind of change. You have to start making enhancements, and those sort of slow things down. And it would appear from the fact that people haven't really gone, part, tried to go past that, that, that that's roughly the sort of the, the economic or efficient kind of limit on that. Um, it's hard to say exactly um, how high. Um, in terms of just the strength of the materials, um, I think this sort of sky's the limit really. We've done um, sort of conceptual work looking at, at um, timber towers at sort of two, three hundred meters say um, when it comes to stiffness from the point of view of um, the dynamic behavior in the wind and sort of occupant comfort of the top story of a very tall sort of um, old timber building if somebody came to me and said you've got you know unlimited budget build me the tallest uh, timber building you can I'd be pretty confident structurally that I could get very very tall far taller than we've um, built so far. Well, I want to I, I wanna thank you very much for the time you've taken. Well, uh, thank you. It's always nice to talk about these things. Thank you.